today's medical grand rounds is ah is ah hosted by the division of ah hospital medicine and the speaker is dr. ah jason persoff who joined the mayo clinic staff in two thousand and one he's an assistant professor in and the mayo college of medicine his undergraduate and medical school training were at the university of colorado and then he's a graduate of both our internal medicine residency program and our chief medical residency program here at mayo clinic florida jason is a physician leader at acls education and an emergency cardiac care education and his talk today is on shocking new developments in resuscitation why compressions matter drugs don't and i'll let you take care of it thanks john i appreciate it yeah and you saw ken swallow when he had to admit that i was actually previously part of this training program so all the quality is there um i like mel's slides so much i'd like to use them um all right uh so i did change it slightly today my talk uh, for those of you who recently recertified in ACLS and BCLS, I'm afraid what's old is new again. Part of this is that I've been waiting anticipating quite uh, fervently the new guidelines, which will come out probably within minutes of me finishing talking and therefore invalidating all of what is discussed today. You still get your CME credit, which is pretty good. So uh, that's not too bad. So anybody know the, um, the movie I'm quoting in the title, Only Most of Dead? Princess Bride, that's right. So I'm going to blave my way through this presentation for those of you who may remember. Yes, of course, that was Max uh, from Princess Bride who determined that our hero was only mostly dead. Um, and then I did want to comment briefly that there's a lot of reasons why we have to have this particular talk. Now, many of you may wonder why do we have to talk about resuscitation at all, and the reason is products like this. Um, I, it's the it, welcome to America, Jimmy Dean pancakes and sausage on a stick with chocolate chips. Obviously, obviously very important to have that. So I know that most of you have had a chance to review your pretest, and actually the pretest that you all have, you don't have, uh, don't worry. We'll go over the answers that all of you submitted. I actually have a very important role here, and I'll, I'll show you that role in just a minute. But we'll start with uh, pretest question number one. Just take your time to read through it if you haven't had a chance to. And you'll see that about 50% of you answered yes. Um, so we'll get to the tomorrow's question tomorrow. Now let me ask another, go to the other question, which um, was even more bizarre. I'm not sure how to interpret that. But the reason that I actually went through these two questions is the time that it took for you guys to read those and for me to post that was around 30 seconds. And what I'm going to argue for you today is those are 30 seconds of time lost uh, forever from your lives, <laughs> which I find funny. But anyway, the, uh, the reason I want to concentrate on time so much is even seemingly trivial things make a huge difference when we're talking about a cardiac arrest situation. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing is debating how we should next proceed. So somebody passes out in front of us and we do very poorly. What I'm going to try to do in this short period of time is emphasize what's important and where we're also going and hopefully what the, what the new guidelines will show, which I'll be wrong about. So the key here is those 30 seconds of having a small laugh, which I thought was funnier in my own office putting those slides together than you did, is actually time where life is lost. Very frequently when somebody goes into cardiac arrest in front of you, it's a very dramatic event and people spend a lot of time checking to make sure the person's okay. Mind you, often the person is not okay, and if we don't act right away, we won't save them. Well, a quick, I'm, I'm only going to go through this briefly because I think it's always fascinating, but this is sort of a brief summary of the history of resuscitation. So chest compressions, just to be clear, were recommended as part of resuscitation about 4,000 years ago. There's a, a bundle of uh, Egyptian papyri. There's even some hieroglyphics up in some tombs, and also there's references in the Judeo-Christian Bible. But of course, we don't remember things very long in medicine, so they were rediscovered again in the 18th century, in the 18th century by Friedrich Moss, who published about his experience doing chest compressions and resuscitating somebody. But it fortunately was the case that um, the Dutch Humane Society picked up on the fact that this Friedrich Moss's uh, uh, wonderful uh, find that closed chest compressions ended up resuscitating man, and they added it to a treatise of approximately 22 things that you can do whenever somebody actually goes into cardiac arrest in front of you. Of those 22 things, they recommended chest compressions with mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. They also unfortunately recommended 
fumigation. Now those of you who've been to my talks will know that I love this fact. Fumigation is a Native American form of resuscitation where you take a peace pipe, fill it with tobacco, light the tobacco on fire, and then stick the peace pipe in the patient's anus and, and, and blow, which is where we actually do get the term uh, that's where about as effective as blowing smoke up. It's actually a form of resuscitation, and, and to me it's more, you know, this is where you sort of sort the wheat from the chaff, because anybody who doesn't respond to fumigation is dead. Um, <laughs> In 1960, everyone got really excited again because suddenly somebody described closed chest compressions in man. This was Knickerbocker, uh, Calvin, and Jude, which sounds more like a law firm. And they suddenly embraced this as a brand new strategy in medicine, but in fact has been around for 4,000 years. We still don't get it always right. All right, so what is going on right now in resuscitation? Well, the American Heart Association created a international liaison committee, which was, was tasked with finding the evidence behind resuscitation. And so they created the ACLS guidelines, which many of you will have been tortured with throughout the years. Because really, as a learning endeavor, ACLS kind of sucks. Because what happens is you have to go to this class, you're not really there to learn anything, and so you sit through those classes so you can get a card that doesn't actually grant certification. It says that you sat there and listened to everything that was said, and there's your card, and you have to repeat the process every two years. Making things even worse was in 2000, the ACLS guidelines got unbelievably complicated with many if and then statements making it even more difficult for those who were being targeted to learn about the ACLS guidelines to actually understand them. 2005, things started to get a little bit better, but where we need to be with the guidelines may actually le lead to a big fundamental split, where you will probably see within the next year or two, many institutions throughout the United States and Canada no longer adopting American Heart Association guidelines and instead going at it their own. And part of the reason is that it's gotten too complicated and the message needs to be very short and to the point, like hopefully I'll be today. All right, so there are some big developments that have occurred in the past few years. The first is um, that we're gonna be talking about compression only chest compressions, which so far has not, has not become the standard yet, but probably will soon, which is to say that we'll be getting rid of mouth to mouth. Many of you may have noticed that actually just a month ago or within the past month, there was a major announcement that mouth to mouth is no longer required for people who are lay people uh, providing uh, rescue services to somebody. And this is in part to make uh, ACLS and BCLS much simpler for people to do, but also because people don't want to do mouth to mouth. So there's also no fundamental reason that we should be doing much in the way of ventilations early on in resuscitation. And in fact, many people need to have a lot of background in how to properly uh, secure an airway. We won't talk about this as much today, but most of the medications you've been forced to memorize probably don't matter at all. And then uh, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about what a rapid response team is. All right, so I'm gonna go over uh, just some statistics because first you have to understand what our goals are in resuscitation. To do that, you have to understand a little bit of the language. But I always caution people that statistics, you know, they can skew you in many different ways. <laughs> Something can be statistically accurate and still completely wrong. Do you guys remember when Ken Jennings was winning on, on Jeopardy? You, you guys don't, okay. Yeah, one of the people answered, uh, the answer was a Monopoly board has four of these. And so the other person rung in and said, what are corners? Which was actually the wrong answer. Um, it's the right answer, but it's the wrong answer. Does anyone know what the right answer is? Railroads. Yeah, it's railroads. What are railroads? So you all fail. Uh, anyway, but. <laughs> so in many ways, you can get the answer right and still get it wrong, and that's an example of that. So what we talk about is in resuscitation, we found out we're very good at doing one thing. We can bring anybody back from mostly dead and we can keep them there for a very, very long time. <laughs> Just long enough for the family to realize they all hate each other and can't decide what mama actually ever said about what she wanted or not. Um, the outcomes in resuscitation vary from death, which is fairly simple. I like resuscitation research because in many ways it's binary, it, you know, it's dead or alive. I like that. But then we get it into a little bit more confusing with terms like return of spontaneous circulation, which is where somebody shouts out in the middle of the code, I think I feel a pulse. It, it, there's no specificity as to whose pulse they're feeling and it may be their own. <laughs> then there's survival to hospital discharge, which is a hospitalist, I like. I wanna reduce the time from you know when this starts to the time of discharge, but that doesn't necessarily mean the patient's recovered. Our main goal is neurologically intact survival. There's a big push for this. 
How many of you remember high-dose epinephrine as a standard of care? Uh, nobody. So anyway, that would, joke is gone. Uh, all right. But we used to be able to bring people back and keep them back. In fact, one of our uh, former esteemed professors here, Steve Grinton, said, I can bring anybody back from the dead if you just give them enough bicarb and epi. And that's true. We can, but they're still in the mostly dead state. So when we're talking about resuscitation, our goals have changed over the years. Our main goal now is neurologically intact resuscitation. It doesn't mean anything if we don't get the person back to being who they were to begin with. So how well do we do this? Well, I'm going to just crunch the numbers for you because it gets otherwise tedious. Surprisingly well, actually remarkably well. About 12% of the time when patients are in ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, we are able to bring them back neurologically intact. And what's the definition of neurologically intact? Able to go on and assume their pre-morbid level of function, including potentially their employment. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty good. That's where we would like people to be, ideally. Um, there are days where I can't get up and actually maintain my own pre-level morbid. <laughs> anyway, I shouldn't admit that in front of my bosses. All right, but it's about 12%. We talk about another set of rhythm derangements, which neither are rhythm derangements in point of fact, but we talk about asystole and pulsus electrical, uh, electrical activity, which have become the dominant forms of resuscitative rhythms, if you will, since we actually invented amiodarone and implanted pacemakers and things of this nature. Still, people used to think that the asystole was the rhythm of death. If you had an asystolic code, it looked great on TV and it looked bad for the patient in real life, but in fact, about 7% of those patients will survive neurologically intact. The hard part, and the part that there's a lot of concentration on, is which patients survive. So how can you sort out before the resuscitation begins which ones will benefit the most from the resuscitation? The bad news is we, as care providers, have a very hard time communicating with our patients about code status. Many times, and I've listened to both residents and staff advise patients and their families that the, the chances of a successful uh, resuscitation in your case are less than 1%, so it's not even worth it. Or people don't understand what resuscitation is. You'll hear, I've always had patients tell me when you br bring up resuscitation, whatever, don't let me become a vegetable. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm like, yeah, it's very hard for me to guarantee that with these statistics. And what does that discussion mean? What would your goals of resuscitation be? We know that the more comorbidities patients have, the less likely they are to survive. In fact, in, in many studies, it's been shown that if patients have an active malignancy, other than prostate cancer, an active malignancy and go into cardiac arrest, 0% will be alive in a year. So it matters what comorbidities patients have. And the more comorbidities, end-stage renal disease, severe coronary disease, awful diabetes that you add up, the less likely they are to survive. But these numbers are for all comers. All right, uh, just an interesting little side bit. Um, the National Registry of CPR, which we're a part of, is, a, uh, is a, a committee, so to speak, by the American Heart Association that is aimed at gu getting information in a prospective fashion on cardiac arrests that occur both in the inpatient and outpatient setting and how do they do. It's the largest database in the world, includes uh, over 15% uh, of U.S. hospitals, all of Canada and some of the other hospitals in other countries. And basically, they collect data on all sorts of codes. And there have been some very interesting studies that have come out. Turns out, if you're visiting someone in the hospital, or you're taking some care of somebody in the hospital, here's what we know from the National Registry of CPR. Usually, you'll code on the general wards in the lobby or in the waiting room. Most are men. Take that. Uh, most people don't think men are visiting, but yeah, we are. And we're coming, and we're dying in droves. <laughs> 43% of them will be in V-fib. Um, the return of spontaneous circula circulation is better than half. 24-hour survival is 38%. But survival to hospital discharge is worse for people who code visiting those who are sick enough to code. In fact, survival to hospital discharge is only 23%. Why is that so important? I think it underscores a very fundamental thing, which is all of us, when we've got our healthcare roles up here, we know what we're doing. You see a patient, the patient is in the sick role, you think of the patient in the sick role, you treat the sick role. But when we see somebody drop unexpectedly, we have no idea what we're actually doing. And hopefully we can get ba better than that. Here's my favorite quote. This is from Adams. Typical cardiac arrest victim receives a fast response as a casino patron than they do as a hospital inpatient. <laughs> in point of fact, the highest survival rates in cardiac arrest research, bar none, occur on airplanes and casino floors. 
not on monitored wards or in the ICU. Now, there's some selection bias. You don't see a lot of ventilated patients hanging out in first class. But that said, it still is a very chilling tale that the best first respond responders are those who will go through training and do the same thing every time when there's an emergency, hook somebody up to an automated defibrillator and to defibrillate without even thinking about it. The more tools, bells, whistles we have, the less likely we are to respond effectively. Since somebody asked, actually, Ken, no one asked, <laughs> but I'm going to blame Nick. Uh, this was um, this was my tornado capture on May 31st this year, so I, I do still storm chase, and that was in Campo, Colorado. I'm actually standing in the Oklahoma uh, state line. That's not anything to do with anything. All right, so <laughs> back to actually important information which we're trying to communicate. Now, let me go through what happens with untreated ventricular fibrillation slash ventricular tachycardia from a physiologic standpoint. This will help you understand what it is we're trying to do when we treat patients. The first thing is, when patients go into a V-fib, V-tac arrest, they enter a period known as the electrical phase. The electrical phase is the first four minutes of cardiac arrest. This is the minute, this is where everyone runs around and does things, but doesn't actually do anything. So everyone knows about my favorite story, but I love to tell it, so I'm going to anyway, because I'm old enough now that I can repeat myself, and people will nod and say, that's all right, it's just Jason getting older. So. There's a picture from, uh, of a trauma cardiac arrest in a book called The Knife and Gun Club, which is a tale about a uh, trauma center in Denver, Colorado, where I train. And there's this beautiful, you know, double sheet of res trauma resuscitation. And there's people piling in there. It's a teaching center, so there's people with short white coats and long white coats and people with no white coats. There's people sticking needles. There's people without needles. There's radiology. There's easily about 30 people in the room. This is a trauma cardiac arrest. And in the foreground, dutifully, working as hard as the person could work, is a medical student checking the patient's patellar reflexes, <laughs> which weren't recorded in the caption. So I don't know what the outcome of those were. Why do I bring that up? Because as a case in point, that is exactly what a lot of us end up doing on a cardiac arrest. There is an incredible amount of movement. There's an incredible amount of activity. Very little of it is directed at the patient. But the room is full and people are moving and that's what's important. Which usually leads to our failure in the first four minutes to get a defibrillator in the room and shock a patient. And in the meantime, while we're waiting, doing chest compressions. Everyone's afraid of hurting a patient, but in fact, we need to be getting at there fast because if we wait, we enter the circulatory phase, which spans about four to 10 minutes. And, and this is where most of the time we start seeing team organization. And what happens is patients need to have chest compressions done for a period of time before their heart will be responsive to a shock. Unfortunately, many codes get organized in the metabolic phase, which is 10 plus minutes later on. Less a problem here where we have in-house intensivists, but at other institutions, this is a big issue where the ER doc is called up from whatever the ER doc is doing to actually run the code. So what happens is our team organization improves as time goes on. Unfortunately, by that point, it's going to be a lot more difficult to bring the brain back. And just to remind you, we're trying to resuscitate the brain, not the heart. All right, so what predicts us not bringing a patient back? Well, survival, is, the, what leads to non-survival is very predictable. We're going to talk a bit about this, which is about chest compressions and their quality. But just to give you an idea, remember back when I told you at the beginning about the pretest questions and I stemmed and stuttered for about 30 seconds. That wasn't a very long 30 seconds. Everything after then has felt very long, I'm sure. But anyway, but that wasn't a long 30 seconds. What we know is that if chest compressions are delayed by as little as 60 seconds, survival begins to decrease. By 120 seconds, patients have about a third a chance of surviving the, the cardiac arrest. So those little time intervals where you're running around, getting help, checking reflexes, all of that, that adds up to bad outcomes. Um, Interestingly, the ACLS training status of nurses has a direct impact on whether or not patients survive. We don't train all of our nurses in ACLS. We train most of them in BCLS. There's a fair number that are ACLS trained. But as we see across national studies, if you're taken care of by a nurse who's not trained in ACLS on the floor and you go into cardiac arrest, there's a 0% chance you're going to be alive at a year. Um, so that's, that's pretty dramatic. Code team arrival. So very often the code team Code team is a big imposition. Um, I know for the residents it's a big deal. There's everything else is going on and you gotta get there and it's the middle of the night and you, you, know, you don't wanna be there. But in fact, we know that it, if, if, pay, if the code team arrives as little as two minutes late, 
survival begins to fall off. And if it takes greater than uh, five to six minutes for the code team to arrive, survival drops to near zero. So really, it's important to respond. Uh, so we'll talk about the quality of CPR. Um, I'll come back to that in a little bit um, about that. But just uh, to wake you up, I love. This has a fractured fibula. Somewhat relevant. Given well, Saturday. So I could be able to go on tomorrow. Daddy's going to be so excited. That killed him. But that was, did you see how on task he was? I mean, the discovery brother was in the room and he responded Dr. immediately. So I thought that was really good. So, how do we resuscitate patients? This is a very, if there is nothing else you take away from my talk, what I want you to take away is the following, okay? This is, this is the whole talk right here. To resuscitate a patient, all right, it's the same thing as the tenets of a good marriage, okay? And they are. Start now, push hard, pump fast, and have good recoil. <laughs> That's not funny, is it? I am getting, I apologize. No, the reason I want, <laughs> and my wife says the code should last for more than two minutes. But anyway, <laughs> the, I try to explain to her what clinical death is, but it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> CPR, this goes over usually better, but I can feel the beaming eyes on me. It was nice working here, folks. Uh, <laughs> CPR, when it's done perfectly in laboratory conditions on people who really need cash, apparently, it only generates about a third of normal cardiac output, about 10 to 15 percent of normal cerebral blood flow, and only 1 to 5 percent of normal cardiac blood flow. That's when chest compressions are done perfectly. And I'll show you exactly how imperfectly we do them in a moment. That's the whole core of making somebody uh, beat, their, uh, beat their heart for them so that they can maintain their brain requires you to push hard. Now, we used to say push to about an inch and a half to two inch depth. <laughs> I have no vertical concept of space, away, and it's very difficult for me to grasp where that is. So push as hard as you can. Uh, there really is no such thing as too far. I suppose if the vertebrae pop out the back of the skin, then you've gone too far, but most of the time that's not an issue. Pump fast. It matters how many compressions per minute the patient gets. Not just how fast those compressions are given, but how many per minute. Interruptions to change rescuers, interruptions to, to bag a patient, interruptions to intubate, all count against the number of compressions you get per minute. So you have to do them fast, and you have to have good recoil. All of us have been on the code where somebody wants to really be the studly guy who's there, you know, no problem, I've got this, and they start doing the compressions, they're, they're moving into it, and then very slowly it becomes something <laughs> like this. Go faster. Harder. And that's what their compressions are. The reality is you've got to be able to push down and come up, and that requires bending at the waist and being over the patient. Some of our patients, it's very hard with my wingspan to actually reach where I need to do the chest compression. So you need to get a lift in many cases. You need to get the bed down. If patients are on floating mattresses, <laughs> you need to get, there's a little code tab on the bottom to deflate them so you're not just ricocheting them back and forth in the air. <laughs> um, but that's, if you take away nothing else, these are the tenets of good compressions. And they should be instituted immediately. Why immediately? Well, when they rolled out AEDs to automated defibrillators to the Seattle EMS uh, back in the 1990s, they found that in the pilot study where AEDs were used to resuscitate victims of cardiac arrest, the survival rates were incredible. The paramedics were getting there and shocking the patients back to life, and that was just amazing. So they said, let's roll it out to all of the EMTs. And as soon as they did that, survival plummeted. It went to, it went to lower levels than it had been before. And they said, why is that happening? And the answer was that now that they had their new bells and whistles, paramedics were showing up and spending time hooking up the AEDs, not actually putting hands on the patient or doing anything to intervene on the patient's behalf. They mandated that the EMTs do at least two minutes of chest compressions prior to even turning on the AED, and all of a sudden the survival was back up to the pilot study uh, levels. This is how important compressions are, even more so than, uh, than even worrying about uh, shocking, but we'll talk about that. I'm gonna go over this very briefly. I usually go into this in much more detail, but here's the bottom line. How do I know when to start chest compressions? The answer is, I've got no good answer. 
um, because we suck at actually checking the pulse. That's right. If we come to us checking patients' pulses, we're only accurate 65% of the time. Uh, the study that was done was very elegant, and basically it took patients who were on bypass, who are on bypass machines, who basically have no systolic or diastolic blood pressure, but a mean arterial pressure, and tasked people with the saying whether or not the patients actually had a pulse. Well, uh, unfortunately, many times they felt pulses when there weren't any there, or they didn't feel pulses when there was one there, and you can imagine this was in a very non-pressured sort of circumstance. Now imagine mom just collapsed, there's 40 family members screaming, uh, there's a med student running in with the reflex hammer, and you've got to try and figure out if the patient's got a pulse or not. Very, very difficult to do in real clinical circumstance. So this was, this was published and everyone said, ah, phooey, but this was repeated again in a, sec in a separate study, but this time in a pediatric population, not necessarily as applicable, still showing that we have a greater than 20% deficit in our accuracy on identifying pulse checks in non-emergency situations. This leads to what is called clinically futile cycles, which is, do, does the patient have a pulse? Don't they have a pulse? I'm not sure. Do you, can you check a pulse? Did you feel the pulse? I didn't feel the pulse. Do you know if that's the pulse? That's, I'm kind of your, and this goes on and on and on, when in fact there should be intervention. So one of the biggest deficits that I have as an instructor and as a, a clinician is I don't have a good answer for you when you should begin compression. But if somebody looks dead, they are dead until they say, ow. Um, if somebody collapses in front of you, does not appear to be conscious, does not appear to be perfusing well, has agonal rhythm or agonal breathing, or you're just not really sure, you are far better off starting chest compressions and calling the code and sort of seeing where things are when everyone gets there than to wait and hem and haw. Remember the 30 seconds at the beginning of this talk. All right, so what about when you actually do start compressions? Does, it, does speed matter? Well, I told you the total number of compressions per minute matters. And that's, again, averaged over the number of compressions during a code over the number of minutes the code lasts. This was data from Benabella that showed that if we look at average compressions per minute, in other words, factoring in the whole resuscitation, once we drop down below 87 compressions per minute, return of spontaneous circulation dropped off substantially. Um, and then there's this data, which came from WIC, which showed that the compressions that were being done, 42% of them, the people were riding the chest. They liked that first compression so much, they didn't want to come back up. They just stayed there. No compressions in this study on human subjects were too deep. So whatever we think we're pushing too far, we're actually probably not. 62% of the time, the compressions were too shallow. So we've committed the big sins of not going fast enough, not going deep enough, and not pushing hard enough. And there's another factor to this. Where does time matter? Compressions are so important that we know that the longer we are not the less likely we are to actually successfully defibrillate patients. We talk about uh, hands-off interval, the delay in seconds from the time that the chest compressions are stopped and the paddles are put up against the chest and we shock and charge and then deliver the shock. If we get those paddles you know, charged up before we put them on the patient's chest, say clear and then put the paddles directly on the patient and shock the patient with less than three seconds between when that last compression occurs and when the shock occurs, we have a high return of spontaneous circulation. But as it is, it usually takes greater than 20 seconds for us to actually make that conversion, and it can be even longer. Many of you have wondered why don't we have automated defibrillators as the standard in the hospital. Um, so for example, in the hospital, we still have manual defibrillators that can be turned into automated defibrillators. Why do we still have manual ones? Well, so far, there's no algorithm that exists for AEDs that allows the AED to analyze rhythm in less than 15 seconds. So what happens is you stop doing chest compressions, your hands are off the patient, the AED is monitoring, 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 and then delivers the shock. In an ideal world, we're delivering those shocks as quickly as possible. So I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but I absolutely love that graphic. Um, well how, do we know that we, how do we know this matters? Well, in, this is from an anesthesia record. What you see is very poor choice of colors, um, is yellow over green, so very easy to see. This is a patient in cardiac arrest. Each of those beats that you see is a chest compression. And the yellow line, which is the upper line, shows the systolic and systemic blood pressures. As each compression occurs, the blood pressure goes up a little more, a little more, a little more. And the right atrial pressure goes down a little more, a little more. All of this suggests that the heart is working better with each chest compression that we do. But as you notice, as soon as they stop chest compressions, all of those physiologic benefits are lost within seconds. All right. Um, now, 
Um, I, I will make a couple more comments about uh, shocking because I think this is also very important. Um, we also know there's a combined message here that not only do we need to do chest compressions well and rapidly, but we need to shock patients as fast as possible too. It turns out that the longer we wait from the beginning of the code to shocking a patient, the less likely they are to survive to hospital discharge. This has led to a very interesting and phenomenal experiment that was carried out last year. So the question becomes, if I'm attached to the patient and somebody shocks the patient, do I get shocked? And to answer this, several European centers thought this would be interesting to look at whether or not we could just throw rescuers on top of patients and shock patients and see if anything bad happens. After all, the FDA only has 52 case reports of anybody as a rescuer ever being injured by uh, paddles. And it turns out, of those, 45 of them were jokes or pranks played on friends or colleagues. <laughs> Great friends. <laughs> So there were only, so narrow it down, there's less than 10 reports ever that anyone has ever been hurt by these paddles by coming in contact with the patient. So the European Resuscitation Council sponsored a study that said, let's go ahead and on patients who are scheduled for routine defibrillation of atrial fibrillation, which usually has lower currents involved than, than full shock, let's go ahead and, and have them put their hands over the pads while their cardiologist standing clear is shocking the patient. And then they said, you know, that's not good enough. Let's attach a lead from the defibrillator to the volunteer onto their skin and let's see what happens. Well, no one died uh, and that's the good news. So they said, God, that's fantastic. Since no one died, we're gonna recommend the following. And this is where the European Council may break the tune with the American Heart Association. So what you see up here are the old approaches Blue line is time spent for rhythm analysis. Then defibrillation charging and delivering the charge. You'll notice there's no green lines on the upper two when that little electrical pulse appears. But you'll notice that during that third one, it was, yeah, we'll analyze the rhythm while we're there. Not sure, keep shocking. Go ahead and deliver the shock. Don't worry about the rescuers. Surprise, okay, keep moving on. And that, my friends, is probably what we're going to be seeing in the not too distant future. If not, with, I can't wait. That. That's going to be very slow to implement is what that's going to be. That's going to be one of those physician level directives. Well, it says the nurses are supposed to do this. <laughs> yeah, and we'll be monitoring this very carefully over the next few years to make sure there's no long-term side effects. You know, your colleague goes twitching down the hall. Anyway, well, that's the only mystery portion of the question is how do they analyze the rhythm? And there is that little piece that's missing. Currently, there is, there is newer technology that has come out with defibrillator pads that are able to zero out based on acceleration the com chest compressions. So you can actually get a background rhythm while somebody's doing chest compressions. Do we have that? No. Are we doing this bottom one yet? <laughs> no. But you know, they're very inexpensive. You could actually just pick them up at Publix. Um, <laughs> I'm going to skip over most of this slide, but I want to call attention to a disparity in healthcare because I think it's very important, which is the National Registry of CPR, which has recorded over 200,000 cardiac arrests, continues to add zeros to their P value on delays in defibrillation of patients who are, who are uh, identified as African American. So blacks get shocked less frequently and less rapidly than non blacks now, I'm not going to try and argue what the, how the data are, uh, uh, are aggregated. When a patient gets admitted, their race is either disclosed or chosen by the patient, so you get into the same issues that we've had with censuses in the past. But I think it's very important to note, this has not gone away. It doesn't matter how small a piece of the pie you look at. Is it the southeast portion of the United States? Is it the entire United States? Is it just Canada? Everywhere the statistics are the same. We don't shock blacks as fast. What do I do with that information? I don't know. I think, again, it underscores the fact that there are continued healthcare disparities. Since electricity and chest compressions are the only two things that work for resuscitation, we need to take a close look at what our practices are. This is sort of shocking in that most of the time the code team is called and has no idea who the patient is who they're responding to. And yet, when we, they get there, there is a statistically robust delay in defibrillation. That's a whole team operating on that level. I don't know why that is. 
Um, all right. So whatever happened to the ABCs in the last five minutes, I'll kind of tell you what happened. We used to think that, you know, in order to prevent the patient from circling the drain, we had to deal with hypoxia, hypercarbia, lactic acidosis, and circulatory collapse. And the best way to do this was to bag the hell out of everyone. That's what we sort of concluded. And that was misguided, much like this woman. Melissa Williamson, 35 of Bullet Avenue, worries about the effect of her unborn child of the sound of jackhammers. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's missing the forest for the trees, ladies and gentlemen. That is what that is. I just love that. You know that photographer was loving that. All right, so, so what are we moving toward? We're moving to this paradigm that is called um, continuous chest compression resuscitation, which has been advocated by Gordon Avey down in Arizona, and he presented here at Grand Round several years ago. Let me tell you why we're moving away from that. First of all, we tend to bag patients incorrectly. There's this phenomenon called iatrogenic hypotension, which is the same as auto peep which basically is where everyone is bagging the heck out of the patient in the belief that they will somehow mystically correct all the problems that are wrong with the patient. When in fact, the best treatments for hypoxia, lactic acidosis, and hypercarbia are circulatory uh, function, we just continue to bag them. So we all know that the appropriate tidal volume for a patient, just roughly speaking, there's all these different modes and what have you, but roughly it works out to about 10 cc's per kilo on a code, about 750 cc's, but the volume of an adult bag valve mass, and this is key here, folks, is about 1.5 liters. In other words, it's twice what you need. And many of you have probably been on codes where people are actually compressing the bag valve mass into the Schwarzschild radius where it consumes into a black hole. They get four people to push it with them, and when that's through, they throw it on the ground and then shove it down. It's because they want to, we're going to bag the patient. I'm not going to do chest compressions, but man, am I going to bag them. All right, so what happens in normal circulation when patients get positive pressure ventilation? This is in patients who are undergoing anesthesia. Where those arrows are, even though they're slightly out of sync, you see the phenomenon of aortic blood flow, pulmonary artery blood flow, and vena cava blood flow. When that positive pressure ventilation occurs, what you see is that when I bag somebody, their aortic blood flow drops off. Remember that cerebral circulation, cardiac circulation are affected very badly um, by not having good compression, good, uh, good delivery of, of circulation. And when we bag these patients, we worsen circulation tremendously. And then we also get into the problem where we over bag patients. The phenomenon of auto peep occurs where patients aren't allowed enough time to actually expire, um, which is a terrible choice of terms, like arriving at the terminal uh, when you, it's the terminal. Anyway, um, but what happens is it ends up filling up the intrathoracic space. We know from real life, uh, resuscitations that uh, fully, two, two, almost two thirds of the time, the rate of ventilations is exceeded in humans. Um, and, and this results in the intrathoracic pressures going up, decreased coronary perfusion pressures, and lower survival. Um, so, what do we need to do? Why do? How should we bag patients? Well, this is a cross section of the average Mayo patient with his tongue back against the back of his throat um, and apparently a head dropping off into the uh, distance. We can tilt the patient's head back to open up the airway and deliver bag valve mass uh, uh, ventilations, but perhaps even better than that is the placement of an oral airway, not an aggressive airway. An aggressive airway should only be undertaken by the intensivists or anesthesiologists and are less important during the first few minutes of the code. All right, so um, I, I'm going to go ahead and move forward just in, in terms of time. Uh, the key here is if you can bag a patient, there's no rush to intubate. Remember that if you're spending time intubating, you're also not spending time doing chest compressions, and it's the chest compressions that ultimately matter. All right, so I'm going to go ahead, and um, I don't have enough time right now to go through uh, hypothermia due to time limitations, but I do want to mention one other thing, which has to do with bagging patients. One of the reasons I want you guys to get away from trying to mess with the airway too much is, in fact, many patients during a cardiac arrest will be gasping. They will actually gasp. And it turns out that gasping is a potent physiologic phenomenon that occurs in an agonal patient. But it also turns out that it has several positive physiologic effects. It, uh, not only does it cause a forceful agonal respiration, it's a marker of improved prognosis, um, improved cerebral and intracoronary intra blood flow, and it helps maintain upper airway patency. When you put the bag valve mask over a patient's face when they're agonally breathing, you're basically suffocating them. That's what you're doing, um, and that we don't want to do. So what the middle ground is that we'll probably see in the new guidelines coming out is placement of a non-rebreather mask during the first few minutes of the code to eventually allow anesthesia or critical care to properly intubate the patient.
All right, so I'll, um, I'll close with this, because we've all seen it, but it's so damn funny, and no, that's not my cat. Um, so <laughs> wait for it. There it is. All right, um, one more time. I know, I know, it's, it's good. So I'll uh, take any questions that anybody has at this point. Yeah, I'll probably have to just switch this off that, because you guys are enamored of that. It's good, though. I like that. Any questions? All right, thank you for your time.